want us to talk about the aftermath of Christmas this morning. What comes to your mind when I say the aftermath of Christmas? Some of us are probably thinking of the work involved. You know, um, well, you know, I have to clean up the mess. I have to sort through all the piles, decide which boxes I'm keeping, which ones I'm tossing, and whose dumpster I'm going to put him in, and all that good stuff. Some people are talking about, you know, maybe it's time to put the tree away. I know there's 12 days in Christmas, but, you know, getting ready for a New Year's Eve, whatever. Some people are cleaning uh, needles out of the carpet. I remember that as a kid. Um, a lot of fun people taking down the decorations. So some people might think of the aftermath of Christmas as just a whole lot of work, you know? Others might think of the aftermath of Christmas as a time to ponder what the New Year's going to bring, you know? For some folks, it's a time to make the proverbial New Year's resolutions, you know? This is the year. I'm going to start down at Snap Fitness and keep going all the way to the end of the month of January instead of just petering out around the 14th, you know? But in the aftermath of Christmas, they consider the things they want to change. I mean, honestly, if I said, how many of us have something about ourselves we'd like to change? I imagine most of our hands would go up. I don't think very many of us look at ourselves and say, ah, perfection, you know? I don't see that. So for some folks, the aftermath of Christmas is a time where they begin to consider, you know, what they want to change and how they're going to beef up their fortitude so that they can make that decision happen in their lives. Begin to plan their strategies. So, uh, you know, for some, it's a time of preparation for the year to come. Couldn't help but notice that Christmas still remains a time of giving. And um, regrettably, it seems to continue to turn away from a spiritual focus to one of a consumer or commercial focus. Did a little bit of marketplace research for you. According to the National Retail Association, 2015, the average person in the U.S. of A., and this blew my socks off, the average person's spending on Christmas, individual, was $805.65, up from last year, which was $802.45. And I'm thinking, whoa, I'm going to have to hang out with those people. What's going on there? $800 plus dollars? Spending, they said spending on gifts for family members will total approximately $462.95, which is up from, from last year. It's a survey high for all time. Almost half of holiday shopping, which consists of browsing and buying both, will be done online this year. Wow. That's up from last year when it was only 44% of people are going to go online. I'd love to take just a real quick survey. How many of you did online shopping at all for Christmas this year? Whoa, it's amazing. Okay, so these guys might know what they're talking about. That's pretty cool. 21.4% of smartphone owners would use their phone this Christmas to buy a gift um, or have used their phone to buy a gift, and I'd like to know how they track that, but anyhow. Nearly half said free shipping or shipping promotions were the most important factor in their decision. If they were going to buy online, they wanted it sent to them for free, I think is what they're saying. 55.8% of holiday shoppers splurged on themselves whilst shopping. Not too surprising. In fact, um, an average of $131.59 was spent on yourself if you were an average Joe in America out Christmas shopping. You dropped just over 100 bucks to uh, satisfy some whim or something that you absolutely could not go home without. Over 40% of retail stores' income uh, of, I'm not saying this right, 40% of retail stores out there, 50% of their income was made because of the Christmas season. That's amazing. If it weren't for Christmas, if it weren't for Jesus showing up and getting the ball kicked off and started, what would they do? So... Let me ask my question. I've asked this every year since 2009, the Christmas of 2009. 
How many of you got a gift for Christmas this, this year? All right. Okay, good, good. Most of us got gifts or had some type of an exchange of some sort. I want you to think through all those gifts, and I'm pulling a WT on you. This is from last week. If you were paying attention, you'll know the right answer. All right? What was the most precious gift you received this Christmas? Oh, come on, somebody take a leap. Okay, we heard family, I heard Jesus, and all those are right up there, aren't they? But the most precious gift we received is the gift of Christ. No matter what present you open, no matter what it's worth, how, does it, how could it possibly beat out eternity if the Savior's born in your life? that most precious gift of all. And in the aftermath of Christmas, we don't want all the whirl and the swirl and the buzz and the, the work to be done and the, the things to ponder upon and the strategies to make. We don't want to let that get lost. So what I wanted to talk about this morning is in the aftermath of Christmas, how do we become more spiritually minded? I mean, if you want a good New Year's resolution, that might be a good one to try on for size. How could I be more after? Atta- the way the Apostle Paul said it was attaining the mind of Christ. Man, I'd love that. I'd love to be able to think like Christ. And as your pastor, your spiritual leader, I, I just want you to accept the challenge that I'm going to offer you this morning. To think beyond ourselves, to, to focus upon a more spiritual reality and really tussle with the question, Can I become more spiritually focused? Can I truly attain the mind of Christ? And the answer is yes. I think all of us, there's a part of us that wants that. You know, to be more like the one whom we follow, the one who's prepared an eternity for us. But we find ourselves distracted constantly by not only the pleasures of the world, but the responsibilities. It's tough. We're constantly being pulled away from just kind of of focusing on, okay, now how would Jesus really look at this? What would be his perception? You know, we said on, on Christmas Eve, we said, you know, would I have seen, would I have heard or would all of that have just passed me by? And, and I just proposed that maybe if you think the answer is yes, I would have seen and yes, I would have heard, it's because as you've gone through this Christmas season, you just didn't see the six o'clock news and say, oh man, all the turmoil and this stuff, it just, what is happening? But you actually saw people looking for an answer, looking for the one who could fill their void just to attain the eyes of the Spirit. And so I thought, you know, if I'm gonna bring up a point like that, maybe I should give some direction from Scripture this morning that might lead us towards that goal, to be able to attain that and say, you know what, I I distinctively wanna strategize to attain the mind of Christ, to be more like Him, to think like Him. But how do I do it? And we turn to the Word of God And I want you to know, every time we try to do this and then give up, we become more calloused. So you know what, if you have any callous going on there, shake that off. Don't say, you know what, I've tried to be more spiritually minded, that's just not for me, and for heaven's sake, don't say it's not my gift. It's one that's already been freely offered to you. We're gonna look at the Word of God at two different places that really give us a roadmap of, hey, if you really want this, try this. And we're going to see that the Word of God has provided a way for us to become more spiritually minded. All right? So let's go to the the Word of God. Two scriptures I want to lead you to today. These are blueprints. They're they're strategies for doing the spiritual discipline of becoming more spiritually minded. All right? To act as spiritual people. And my prayer is that you're going to take these two passages home with you. There's no way I can preach it all out and explain it all, but you know what? I can lead you to it. And then as you jump into it in the, this week and the coming weeks, let the Holy Spirit um, bring to mind those things that you can do to get in line with these passages in his word. And actually what I'm saying, to be obedient, because this is actually a command. It's actually not just an invitation. It's a command to have the mind of Christ, 
So let's open first of all to Philippians and chapter four. Paul's writing to the church in Philippi about having the mind of Christ. Why? Because it's right up there is something pretty important if you want to be a Christian, a follower of Christ. And so in chapter three, he proclaims that we're to have the mind of Christ, to think and act upon the things of the Spirit as we work out our salvation, to walk with the Lord. He says that many will seek to walk with God but not actually know him, and that should scare all of us. What? There will be people who want to walk with the Lord and start doing it and then they fall away? Why? And he says because they set their mind on earthly things. Oh, they get involved in all the consumerism, all the commercialism. They get involved in all the pleasures of the world. They get distracted from keeping the main thing, the main thing, loving God, loving one another, and making disciples. How? They set their mind on those earthly things. So, all that's well and good, but what are we to do? How are we to do that, Paul? And thank God he didn't stop writing. The Holy Spirit continued to give him these words. In chapter four, it says, do not be anxious about anything. Let's take a quick quiz. How are you doing on that? How are you doing on not being anxious about anything? Okay, all right, just checking. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, now did you catch that? In everything, with thanksgiving, all right? Present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, Thank you, Jesus. We'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. And then it says, finally, brethren and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, I'm gonna say that again, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, Paul says, or seen in me, I want you to put that into practice. Now, there's a guy walking the tightrope. He's saying, I'm standing before you as your pastor. The things you see me do, the way you see me talk, the way you see me interact and, and, and treat other people, you do those things. I don't think I'm there yet. I want to be. I want to attain the mind of Christ. But that's where Paul's at. This guy who wrote half the New Testament, he's saying, you know what? I've gotten that far along, so watch me. Do it. I'm modeling it for you. I want you to know that's what Jan and I, we, we truly, truly aspire to do, is to model it for you. But you know, at the end of the day, this is something you've got to develop as an individual so he doesn't stop there. He's saying, okay, so you can check us out, see what's going on, and uh, whatever you've learned, received, heard from, you've seen me put into practice, and he says, and the God of peace will rule in your hearts. He will be with you. In other words, you will have the mind of Christ. Oh, really? So I have to do what? I have to think about what things? Those things that are noble, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. You think on those things. And so I'm just gonna take stock for a moment. You know. What does it mean, those things that are true? Think about truth, what does that mean? It means spend some time in the word of God. The one thing we know is that what we find in God's word is truth, amen? You gotta spend some time in it, you gotta immerse yourself in it daily. 20 minutes on a Sunday morning, just enough to give you, uh, keep you from dying from an- spiritual anorexia, all right? But a daily dose is that cleansing, the truth that flows through us. Even when we walk away from the morning passage that we've read and go, wow, I'm not sure I get that. You meditate on it throughout the day. Just kind of ruminate, dwell on it, and see what it does for you, how God uses that. He brings it up sometimes a month or years later, and suddenly it all fits and makes sense because you thought about that which was true. Take time to initiate discussions with other people about the truth. That'll put you into the truth because it'll put you right back into the word. Second of all, he says those things that are noble, and this this Greek term for noble means worthy of respect. 
things that are worthy of respect. As believers, we're called to think about those things that are, I don't know, worthy of awe, worthy of admiration. In other words, good things. Now, how many of you, don't raise your hand, how many of you can say that there's times you just spend dwelling on things that are negative or downer? Or, you know, that neighbor of mine, doggone it, and the mind starts twisting, and is there anything, I don't know, noble about that? Where have you let your mind dwell? You've been pulled aside by earthly things, haven't you? See, and that's what he's saying. Think about things that are true. Think about things that are noble. And one thing that Jan has helped me realize is that I can't think about things that are noble sitting in front of a television very easily. Think about it. I looked at the research, and I am not going to share it with you this morning because it's dismal. The average number of hours that a United States citizen sits in front of a TV is off the charts. And I wanted to be a little more positive this morning, so we're gonna move on. We also think those things that are not just true and noble, but just, right? Those things that are right. As believers, we're to think in harmony with God's divine standard of holiness. And you can't know God's standard if you don't read it. It's back to the word every time. Be in the word. Think of those things that are right, that are true. True, noble, just, or right. And now it says pure. Hmm. That which is morally clean. Jan's helping me with this one too. How many movies can you turn on from Hollywood that stay morally clean? Ouch. She's got me watching Hallmark Christmas specials. (laughs) Pray for me. Thanks, honey. (laughs) But it is true, garbage in, garbage out. It's true. How we love to fill our minds with that which is perhaps less than pure. And Paul's just saying, you want the mind of Christ, Scott? Get with the program. Think of those things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Dwell on those things, and guess what? No more garbage going in, and what comes out? Because from the fullness of the heart, the mouth gives utterance, the mouth speaks. You put garbage in, and I'm here to tell you, eventually it slips out. Keeping right down the list, it says those things that are lovely. This is just another Greek term that comes right back to the same thing. Those that are things that are amiable, pleasing. As the as believers, we're supposed to be centered in on things that are kind. So plotting your neighbor's demise because they ticked you off again is not exactly filling in that blank. We got to move on. If we want to have the mind of Christ, if we want to become more spiritual creatures, we're going to have to follow this and say, okay, what's lovely about this? Not a thing. Move on. Of good report, things that are highly regarded, well thought of. This this word has a whole idea of courtesy and kindness and respect for others. Folks, whatever is a virtue, praiseworthy, that's what we're to think on. So when we find ourselves in the negative world, we just have to do an about face if we want the mind of Christ. Now, how can our actions spur us towards having the mind of Christ in in the midst of this swirl, this, this aftermath of Christmas? Let's move to another passage here very quickly and we'll just dissect it quickly. Second Peter chapter one, I'm just gonna do verses two through eight. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. How do you get knowledge of God? Through conversations with other godly people and spending time in the word of God. Um, This is a broken record message. It's about being in the word. It's where it all comes from. But grace and peace will be yours in abundance through your knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need. Don't miss that. Everything we need uh, for what? For life and godliness through our knowledge of him. In other words, it goes right back to the word who called us by his own glory and goodness. Can you see the importance 
He writes it, 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 here in 2 Peter. Now we've had Paul, now we got Peter weighing in. He's saying, you know, you want the mind of Christ? It all goes back to being in the word because that's where we get our knowledge of God. It all goes back to our time in fellowship with one another when we're talking about things of the spirit, talking about things of the Lord because we grow in our knowledge. How many of us have gone to a small group and grown in our knowledge of God because of somebody else's insight? How many of you have been doing the Advent devotional that we created? Can I see some hands? Yeah, how, ma- how many of you gained an insight uh, just by looking through the window of somebody else's world as they look at to see how Christ is um, acting in their life or, or how he's acting through them? I mean, it's just awesome. That's how you get it, by spending time doing the right things. So he says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them, through those promises, you may participate in the divine nature. That means you can be a godly woman. You can be a godly man. You can attain the mind of Christ. How? He doesn't stop there. He says you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So that means that I can be in this world but not of it? Oh yeah. It's not just possible. It's something we're called to. And then he gives us the key. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge. And to knowledge, add self-control. Yeah, I don't know if we want to get down that road. And to self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, add godliness. And to godliness, here's the word Philadelphia, brotherly love, brotherly kindness. And then to brotherly love, add love. Now that's that word agape that some of you may have heard about. That means a perfect love. All right? Beautiful. And then he says in verse 8, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, in other words, this is a journey we're on. You don't get it all with one big ecstatic zap. Whoa, I'm godly. Well, you know, I just blew it on the humility factor, so maybe I'm not. Right? It's a catch-22, but here he's saying no. If you take these qualities and increase them in increasing measure in your life, what? If you're adding to your faith goodness, doing good things, right? And to goodness, add knowledge right back into the Word of God, right back into fellowship and, and talking with other people about the things of God. And to add to that, to that knowledge, add self-control. Basically, that's Peter saying, you know, like now you know what you're supposed to do, go do it. Have the self-control to not just hear the word of God, but to put it into practice in your life, right? And to self-control, add perseverance. Why? Because you got to stick to it. There's a lack of stick to itiveness in this nation. We are soundbite culture now. We like about 30 seconds of anything, and after that, we're moving on. You know, it's amazing, but it's like Peter knew what he was talking about. Or could it be that this is the Holy Spirit of God writing through Peter's pen, saying, Scott, you know, add each one of these things in your life if you want the mind of Christ, if you want to become the godly man that I've designed you to be. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective. I don't think any of us want to be ineffective as we love God, love one another, and make disciples. When we go out and cast seed, when we go out and put a little bit of worm on the hook and try to draw people in, we want to see some fruit. We want to see a reward. We want to see us being effective, fruitful in Christ. He says, If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge, in what you're learning from the Word of God. But if anyone does not have them, if you don't have these things, if you're not doing them intentionally, they become nearsighted. This is, in the Greek, it's the word myopia. 
Uh, you've probably heard of that. It's an actual eye disease for being nearsighted, right? So he's saying if you don't do these things, you'll become nearsighted and blind. In other words, it'll be a progress. It'll be progressively, you'll get further and further and further away from being the godly man or woman that God designed you to be until finally you'll be blind. Blind to what? And forget that you've been cleansed from your sins. He's saying you'll forget you're saved? Yeah. Uh, this is pretty important. If you're not pursuing becoming the godly man or woman that God designed you to be, if you're not following some systematic approach, some pilgrim's progress towards that goal, God is telling us, you know what, be careful. You'll become nearsighted. Be harder to, for you to get it. And after a while, you'll become blind. You'll forget the fact that I even came and gave my life for you. And that you're saved from all that. Do you hear the message in these passages? This is the recipe, this is the blueprint for attaining the mind of Christ. Might be a good challenge to place before you in the coming year, in the coming weeks, because we can have his nature by working on building these things into our lives, into our homes. Take these passages home and really study them. Let the Lord speak to you as an individual, maybe as a couple. Make a plan to pursue this, for if you don't plan to succeed in God's power, you have surely failed without his power. You've planned to do it. By lack of planning, you've planned to fail. You know, I, we don't have time to go into detail into all these. I think I, I hit enough of it so that we understand these are steps that we must put in as a spiritual discipline in our lives that we might build upon our faith to become that uh, immovable, unstoppable force that says, you know, there is no obstacle too great. As a body of believers, as New Leaf, we can take folks for Christ here in Conneaut. Our shadow can cast a lot further than Kania, but right now we're kind of concentrating on what we can see immediately in front of us. And we gotta be building ourselves up. I'm just gonna let you go through this passage, just leave that for you and the Lord to work out together. I think that there's a key here to being spiritually minded, to growing in the Lord, and I'm gonna close with this. Had somebody teach me this on a good old uh, gravel road outside of Alliance, Ohio. His name was John Walters. If you want to put spiritual disciplines in your life that you're finding that it just kind of peters out, you're having difficulty, I want you to remember this. When you ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, you can't do that unless you're also asking him to be your Lord. I want you to think that through with me this morning. Because I said, John, because he was asking me to give my life to Christ, and I said, you know how many hundreds of times I've given my life to Christ, and it just doesn't take. And he said, well, Scott, that's because you're looking for a Savior that isn't a Lord. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you want Jesus the Savior, but you don't want Jesus as your Lord. I'm like, okay, is that really my problem? He goes, well, how much of the word of God do you know that you're not doing right now? Oops, he saw the top of my head. <laughs> you know, what was I gonna say? I knew better. There were things in my life that had no business being there. And yet I was pursuing them, what we call the pleasures of the flesh. <laughs> he said, see, Scott, you, you want the Savior, but you don't want him as Lord. You decide to take him as both, Everything changes, everything. Because suddenly, you're able to instill these disciplines in your life. You know how hard it is to go from watching trash on a screen to then saying, okay, now I'm gonna think about those things that are true and noble and right and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy, what? 
You just, there's no switch where you can go on and off like that. And what good does it do you? Because what you've got is garbage going in and truth going in, and the two are at odds. He was saying, Scott, make sure that uh, you've not just invited a Savior, but that you've invited a, him as Lord. And that's what I'd share with you this morning. You need him as both. It doesn't work if you only take him halfway. If you only give him half a throne, if you only give him Sunday, or maybe Sunday and small group night is Wednesday, so you know, Sunday and Wednesday is your God, the rest of them are mine. I'm just here to tell you, you will fall flat on your face constantly in your walk. You'll go up and down and mostly down. Peter and Paul both said it very well. You set your mind on earthly things, you're already doomed. But if you want to attain the mind of Christ, if you really want to start being the godly man or woman that he's called you to be, praise team, come on up here. Um, it's time to do some, something that I did years ago and that I have to do daily. Regrettably, I'm a slow study. And I got to do it daily. And that is... I gotta set my mind on Jesus as my Savior and my Lord and pursue these recipes, these spiritual discipline, this blueprint that he's given me. And I want you to know I'm not there yet, but I'm a trying. And I think that's all we can do with each other is keep on keeping on. Don't forget right in the middle of that list that we got from Peter was perseverance. That means to keep on keeping on. That's what we got to do. Every time we realize, ah, we've strayed again, I'm getting into this or I'm getting into that or I'm not doing any of these things, you don't beat yourself up. That's like if you're suffering from anorexia, go to the fridge, eat. You know, it is that simple. It's difficult to get over that if you have that, uh, you know, systematic disorder, but it is that simple. And I'm talking about spiritual anorexia now. If you realize you've stopped getting into the word, don't beat yourself up. Don't give me the, I had somebody just on Christmas Eve saying, you know, I came for Christmas Eve, I cried the whole service, I'm gonna get myself right and I'll be back. And I, had, I was immediately conflicted. How do I tell this dear soul that if they wait to get right, <laughs> it's gonna be a while before we see them. We need Christ to make things right, amen? amen? Amen, so let's pray. Lord, this, it sounds so easy, probably because it is. You said that you use the simple to confound the wise, and this is your gospel. Lord, we believe it to be your truth, and we wanna be the godly man or woman that you've called us to be, so help us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna ask our ushers to come at this time, and.